Okay, welcome everybody for uh, to the end and last session of the day for day two of the Toronto Machine Learning Summit and our bonus workshop day. So I will um, welcome Ram here in a second. Um, we're gonna give folks a little bit of time here to join. I know some people are streaming in from previous workshops. If you're just joining us, thank you so much uh, for coming in. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope you've enjoyed the workshop days uh, so far. I know there's a couple blips and a couple um, things with the links that, that always happen. So apologies in advance, but I hope it's been more or less a smooth ride. Uh, one of the things for tomorrow that I will mention is that the conference talks will be held on the conference platform, which is hopin.com. So if you're not sure, make sure to check your email and you'll have a, a unique link to join hopin.com. And that starts tomorrow morning we'll be, where we will be doing the uh, keynotes and breakout sessions there. So for those who are joining, I, I ask that you uh, make sure to ask questions. If you're curious, make sure to ask questions. Ask Ram. He's been very generous with his time and I'm sure would uh, be happy to answer any questions that you have. And um, as well, if you are interested in joining some of the other folks uh, who have attended this event, are attending, have registered, we have the Whova app. So I hope you enjoy that too. We have about 850 people registered on that. You can see a lot of the speakers communicate with them or some folks who are uh, initiating some chat, also see some open job positions, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you can join us for that. Now, I won't uh, waste too much time. Um, I do want to take a minute to thank Ram. He's uh, been very generous in, in opening uh, us up to some of the work that he's been doing. And it is really interesting, so we're very grateful for that. Um, if you're not familiar with Ram, he is a, uh, a popular ML instructor on Coursera. He's also a current uh, program manager for Google. Uh, Rems worked in machine learning for more than five years. Previous to that, he served as a data scientist at Morgan Stanley and as an instructor at General Assembly. So he's the author of the popular uh, Python AutoML uh, libraries, AutoViz and AutoVML, which we'll be talking about today. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Rem. Thank you. And uh, are you going to record this? Um, um, I believe it is recorded, unless you tell me that you're not able to, in which case we won't. No, I, I am able to. I uh, I don't yep. see a record button, so um, you are. We are recording, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. All right, so welcome uh, everyone to my session. Uh, Toronto Machine Learning uh, Society makes um, amazing conferences, and um, I'm always been a, a participant, a learner. Um, so I. Um, you know, I'm lucky to, I'm honored uh, to be presenting um, at this conference, uh, which is, in my opinion, uh, one of the top conferences in North America for practitioners. Um, and uh, their uh, finance uh, summit uh, is something that I uh, liked so much um, that I wrote uh, a very nice uh, email thanking them and then um, decided to uh, take the plunge and present um, in one of the workshops in the future, and they uh, were kind enough to call me back uh, to present. So here I am, uh, going to talk about my uh, library called Deep Out of ML. You might have heard of Out of ML, uh, which is uh, basically based on scikit-learn. Uh, Deep Out of ML is a version of that, and uh, it um, <clears throat> it works on, uh, as you can imagine, um, TensorFlow uh, and uh, Keras, um, which are deep learning libraries, and um, it helps you in uh, building what I believe to be, um, you know, performant uh, machine learning models in a, a short amount of time. The key uh, features of, of the work um, that that is deep out of the now will be shared here. I'll also show you uh, some examples and also help you understand how you can very quickly take this model development uh, into if you believe that it's a performant model uh, into production with a very little uh, effort, uh, simply uh, because I, I believe there are some features here that you like. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what is uh, Deep Out of ML? Basically, it comes out of uh, work that I've done in the past. Um, you can see my main GitHub page here, uh, which is github.com uh, slash out of ML. And that's the main page where I showcase uh, some of the work um, that I've done in the last two and a half uh, years. It comes out of work that I did um, when I was a, an instructor, um, uh, you know, before uh, coming to Google. 
And um, so I probably spent close to four to five years on developing these libraries. And um, I decided only in the last couple of years to uh, open source them. And uh, Google has been very supportive. And uh, finally, happy to announce that uh, we've got uh, quite a bit of traction with these models, uh, with these AutoML tools. AutoML basically helps you um, build multiple uh, models and, and fine tune them uh, with, with one line of code. AutoViz uh, is currently used a lot uh, in EDA, what's known as AutoEDA, and uh, AutoTS is a library for time series. And FeatureWiz is um, the one that I believe um, is uh, very much underappreciated, uh, but probably it's the uh, secret sauce uh, behind all of the success of all of these models. So I, I am a little bit surprised why FeatureWiz um, is, uh, does, is not getting this kind of attention um, that the rest of uh, my other libraries have gotten. <laughs> it's really a mystery to me, um, but um, it is actually the secret sauce um, that is common to all of these libraries. It enables uh, these AutoML libraries to function um, because it selects the best features out of the, uh, uh, out of the data set and builds models. So if you see AutoViz, it selects the best features uh, before uh, visualizing them. Auto Time Series does the same, Auto ML does the same, and they all use FeatureWiz, but almost uh, nobody's heard of uh, FeatureWiz. So, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, that will change sometime in the future. Uh, what I find about fascinating about GitHub is it's not the amount of GitHub stars that a library has um, that that is important, uh, at least to me. If a GitHub, uh, you know, has two stars, uh, but it does the job for me and uh, so on, uh, even if it is unknown, um, that's fine uh, as long as uh, you know you find it useful. So I've never judged uh, uh, GitHub by uh, the number of stars. Um, though I've been happy to get um, the number of stars I've gotten. But uh, if you are looking to judge um, GitHub's mainly by stars, um, I would say uh, you might want to check out FeatureWiz, which currently does not have much popularity, but it's got probably the most amount of uh, secret sauce behind uh, success of all other libraries. All right, how does Deep Auto ML work? Uh, Deep Auto ML works um, primarily um, by this flow that you're seeing here. It's very uh, simple uh, process uh, based on a single line of code. And once you um, invoke the single line of code, um, you would be able to uh, run this entire process from that code, from that, uh, what I call a command line like interface. It's very scikit learn like it uses fit and predict. Um, so if you do fit, um, most of the work here is done. First, you need to provide your data set in the form of files. Uh, this is not um, a, a, you know, similar this is not very <clears throat> common. Um, usually people just take one file um, and build a data pipeline out of that one CSV file. But here with Deep Out of ML, you are going to be able to progress and uh, provide a set of files. So you can provide a set of text files, you can provide a set of image files, like an entire folder. And you can also um, provide um, right, a CSV file that's very large, uh, in which case you, are, you will be able to not just uh, you won't be able to uh, load it into memory, but we will build a link uh, to that data at rest, and we will build the data pipeline by just taking only batches of uh, batches of rows into the pipeline. So TensorFlow does not load like Pandas does the entire uh, file that you have into memory, and so you're not limited by memory. It only uh, takes a, a batch, let's say 32 rows, and it takes a batch from your file and, and loads it into memory. So any moment in time, you are not constrained by the size of files you have. I'm gonna show you an example with uh, one gigabyte of data uh, on a demo. <laughs> Hopefully it goes well, um, but most uh, folks who do demos of AutoML tools start with um, MNIST um, files um, or MNIST as the example. And I will show you later um, why that is very deceptive. Um, whereas what you're gonna see with WaterML is what you're gonna get. You're gonna see one gigabyte of data being processed and you're gonna be able to go home and be able to reproduce the same with uh, no change in code. So that's uh, one of the uh, defining features of deep out of ML. It's not a toy. Uh, it's really meant to process a very large amount of data. Second, um, it, it builds a data pipeline through TensorFlow 
It uses Keras uh, pre-processing layers. These just came out in 2.4. Um, these pre-processing layers are not like the feature columns that you're used to in TensorFlow. These are uh, actual layers that uh, go into a model. And as part of the model, you can save them. And once you get your new data, you can actually use the model to make predictions because it's got all the pre-processing layers built in. Um, third, um, we find the best model architecture by using what we call tuners or optimizers. I've got Optuna and I've got another uh, tuner known as Storm. So there are two tuners built in for you to find the best uh, architecture and the best um, model with the number of layers, number of uh, you know, different activation functions and so on, all of those. And finally, uh, train your model. And we, you can also export the model uh, because it's a TensorFlow model with pre-processing layers built in, you can export it to uh, a cloud. So I am uh, going to uh, show, um, you know, take questions uh, straight uh, from the chat. And that's one way um, that I find um, is helpful. So uh, the first question here is where is the pipeline sequence saved in the file system uh, um, in a database or cloud? Uh, great question. So um, the pipeline is part of the model. So wherever you save the model, uh, the pipeline is in it. Um, that's a great part. So you, you will, uh, I will show you uh, that later on, you're going to be able to point your model at another file and make predictions. And the file could have been uh, in your local file system or it could have been on the cloud. Uh, and, and, and that's the beauty of, uh, you know, TensorFlow, Keras, and so on. <clears throat> so um, now there is another um, important feature here. Single line of code is one feature common to all of my models that I, all of my tools that I built. If you see the word single line of code, um, you can probably um, guess that um, you know something like what I do, um, or you, when you look at my uh, libraries, you can probably guess that a single line of code is probably how to operate them. Um, the second is uh, bring your own model. You can bring your own uh, model architecture and you can feed it to deep out of the null and it'll take your model and train it on this data. So that's one of the uh, other things. And like TensorFlow Hub has multiple models. I don't know if you are familiar with TensorFlow Hub, but we're gonna take one of those models and we're gonna show it to you how it works. I'm going a little slower um, than I normally do, uh, but um, later on, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm trying to basically get to the demo. And, um, and then we, once you get to the demo, I'll answer, ask, uh, I'll answer more questions, uh, but let me um, kind of, um, uh, explain what is different about deep out of ML, why you need to use it. So the main design goal for deep out of ML was, I wanted to reduce the time it takes uh, to go from experimentation to uh, production, uh, simply because I felt like currently um, building a TensorFlow model using uh, Pandas and NumPy does not help um, teams go to production. As you all know, 90% um, of the data sets um, in the real world uh, will not fit into a single file and neither will they fit into pandas. Um, but if you look at 90% of the uh, notebooks on, on Kaggle, on, on GitHubs and everywhere, they all work on small um, data sets that they load into pandas and NumPy. Um, and, and then they uh, write uh, four lines of uh, Keras code and they think, why do we need deep out of ML? It's totally useless, right? Um, we, we can write four lines of Keras code with four layers or three layers, and all we have to have is pandas uh, or a NumPy array. Uh, we don't need deep out of ML, right? That's what most people tell. But if you um, are from the real world, and if you have petabytes of data, you know that um, none of them will ever fit into pandas, and you will have to do something else, and you don't know what that something else is and it'll take you maybe a couple of years um, to get to that point where I have gotten in order to build this. So um, I hope that um, you, you are asking um, the tough questions of people that are uh, sharing uh, what they consider to be AutoML uh, tools um, and ask them questions like, can you demonstrate this on one gig of uh, data right now? And uh, I bet that it, it won't run one gig of data. And secondly, if it runs on one gig of data, um, it will probably take a couple of days to get back an answer. But we are going to run 
on, on today, one gig of data, and it's going to finish um, just before this presentation ends. So that's the kind of difference that deep part of ML makes um, to uh, folks in the real world. All right, so uh, what's uh, different? Well, you know, most traditional machine learning, machine learning workflows are about data acquisition, exploration, preparation, you do some feature engineering, you select a model, um, you train the model, make predictions, and this takes a few months. Um, and that I think is very important. I, I believe all of these steps are very important, but let's say you've got some uh, data, but you want to, uh, you know, use AutoML and you want to kind of compress all of these steps where like feature engineering is done by the model and you want to see how this model performs. So two reasons why you want to do this. One is you want to build a baseline model. That is just, uh, you know, you have a team, you are a manager, you want to compare what a baseline result um, would do against your team. And second, challenge a model. You have a, a, a your own uh, ambition is to build the best model possible and you want to challenge yourself. So you go to a, a tool like Deep Out of ML and you say, how am I, uh, I'm going to explore whether I can beat the model performance by Deep Out of ML. So you can use it as a baseline model or you can use it as a challenge model, but we are going to go beyond that today and we can show you how to put this into uh, this model into uh, a pipeline that can uh, make predictions in, 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 in a cloud. So there are two things that's um, also under the hood that Auto Vimal uh, has that uh, other, um, uh, I would say, AutoML tools for deep learning don't have. One is Optuna. So it uses Optuna under the hood, which is a framework agnostic uh, tool that you can use for any machine learning or deep learning framework to, um, you know, tune uh, your models and your parameters. So one option is Optuna, which is very uh, popular. The other option is not so uh, famous. Uh, but something that I love uh, is, is by a young uh, person uh, who uh, just recently launched this library. And I found this uh, called Storm, a stochastic uh, random mutator. Uh, it's a high performing, robust hyperparameter um, op optimizer for high dimension of categorical and numeric uh, uh, hyperparameter tuning. It, it, it does much better, much faster than Optuna but it's not that famous. So if you're looking for famous um, and you want the safe answer, you got Optina, but you want the uh, more risky, but faster, built by a young uh, person who's hungry and, and can actually um, beat the performance of other uh, tuners out there, then I think you ought to go look at uh, Storm. Uh, so Auto Vimal uses both Optina and Storm. You can just uh, switch between one or the other. All right, so how deep auto ML can help you? We can experiment with multiple deep learning architectures. I'm sure you can do this with other um, deep uh, auto ML libraries. Um, I, I won't mention them, but I'm sure you can Google and find them. They, they have teams of sometimes even 50, 100 people building them. And um, you can experiment with multiple deep learning architectures. Uh, but with this uh, deep auto ML, you, you can do the same and you can do it much faster. And it's uh, also, it works on structured data, image and NLP, and I'll show you uh, all three today. And it can handle very large data sets like we're gonna show you. Uh, so you're not limited by pandas. And finally, it provides performant models for taking far less time to, to build them. <clears throat> There's a question. Uh, you'll get the slides later. Um, that's, um, we will send it to you. All right, uh, so how does Deep Auto ML build models? The old way of building models uh, in, in TensorFlow 1.x was something known as feature columns. If you remember, um, you had Keras input layers, and then you had feature column layers, and then you had model layers, and all these were separate layers. So when you saved your model, it saved only your model layer. Um, now you have to re re redo all of your feature column layers, and you will have to do uh, in, during prediction, um, your data has to go through feature column and you have to include that as a separate pre-processing function. Now um, with Keras, uh, with TensorFlow 2.4 onwards, Keras came up with a brilliant idea called pre-processing layers. These pre-processing layers are just like uh, deep uh, uh, dense layers. Uh, you can actually uh, you know, combine them with hidden layers like dense activation layers, dropout, flatten, convolution layers, and so, so on. And these pre-processing layers 
are saved along with the model. So when you want to make a prediction for the model and you send in raw data, the model will use the pre-processing like category encoding, hashing, uh, string lookups, integer lookups, and transform your entire data to be ready to be processed by dense layers. So this is a brilliant idea. Um, and this is what motivated me to build uh, Deep Out of the Mel. When I saw this, I said, this is something that's very exciting and we should put it out there for the rest of the world. So um, uh, that's one reason why you, you see this combined. This is uh, your entire model has both hidden layers as well as pre-processing layers. So it uses a uh, very good question by Surosh. It uses TF data, data set uh, completely under the hood. So uh, everything uh, in, in deep out of ML is TF data dot data set based. And anyone who has worked with TF data, uh, data set probably has a lot of scars uh, on their back, um, a lot of arrows on their back. Uh, it's an extremely difficult uh, uh, right, uh, thing to master. Um, and if you're trying to do the kind of things, which is to build an auto ML tool on TF data data set, um, you can kind of imagine the scars that I have on my back. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, intensive process um, that, uh, you know, there are questions that I've asked um, that are probably not even answered on any GitHub or any Stack Overflow uh, column anywhere. Um, but those have been basically solved. Uh, using deep out of ML. So if you are interested in TF data data set and working with them, you should basically spend some time studying how deep out of ML has solved some of the problems that TF data data set users have encountered over time. So um, there are lots of things that deep out of ML has solved that you will find if you are currently a TensorFlow 2.4 uh, engineer um, that you are struggling with. And, I would advise you to go read uh, Deep Out of ML code under the hood to uh, solve those problems in case you come across them. Is that helpful? All right. So, um, uh, you know, we, uh, we are now going to syntax. It's very simple syntax from Deep Out of ML. We import Deep Out of ML and, and, and you, um, you uh, call it Deep Auto. And then um, you basically say Deep Auto fit, train target. The rest are all uh, defaults. Uh, that's how simple it is. You just uh, fit on a train file or a set of files or a folder, and it will uh, just need one thing, which is the target name variable. The rest are all automatically filled in by me. Um, you don't have to even know. And then you get back two things. One is the model, and then you get the uh, what I call artifacts, which is uh, the categorical variables, how they need to be uh, transformed. Some have to be integers, some have to be string, you know, that kind of uh, feature pre-processing, I would call it. These are defaults that you have to save and you got to use that and to feed it into predict. So in the predict function, you again feed the model, you give it the project name, which is where the folder, uh, where you can find all of this. Uh, and then you can put, provide it the test data set and, and, and the cat vocabulary dictionary is, is from here. The Keras model type, the Keras model type is what drives your um, pre-processing your, your model building. It's currently set to auto. We're gonna change that and, and you're gonna see how that works. So the Keras model type is the main driver to control deep auto ML. You can think of it as the, um, as the main console. So if you set the Keras model type and say fast, you will get a fast uh, structured data, tabular data model. If you use fast one, you will get a deep and wide model. The deep and wide model is probably one of the best, uh, I would say in my opinion, one of the best model architectures um, right now. Uh, but I'm pretty sure people will have uh, personal opinions that differ with that. Uh, but if you haven't uh, tested a deep and wide model, you should. And uh, with deep out of ML, you'll be able to do that immediately with just changing fast to fast one and you'll get a deep and wide model. There is a variation to the uh, deep and wide model called the deep and cross model. Um, so I've incorporated that as fast two. So fast, fast one and fast two will give you models in minutes uh, versus hours for other uh, auto ML tools. And then um, if you wanna use auto, you're gonna use Optuna or you're gonna use Storm and that will take you know maybe half an hour or more to build a model. So you, you gotta keep that in mind. Um, uh, <clears throat> 
After this, I'm going to um, show you exactly uh, how to run it in a uh, actual data set. Um, but if you change a Keras model type to NLP, you'll get a simple NLP model. If you use text, you'll get a slightly more advanced model. If you use BERT, uh, the word uh, BERT, you'll get a BERT uh, based model. And finally, image. Uh, if you use the word image, you use image classifier. So we're going to now pause. I'm going to kick off a model run uh, so that we can get the one gig uh, model running. And then we'll, we'll come back and, and take a look at it and take questions. <clears throat> So there's a question on uh, time series data and feeding the training with multiple records. So I'm going to answer that question in a second. All right. So let's um, let's uh, share a new um, new one, which is this. Okay. So let's go. All right. So I recently posted a. a <clears throat> A model. So my uh, my model notebooks um, can be found here. Um, and those of you who are um, interested in my uh, all of my notebooks, um, you can you can go there. Um, and I'm I'm going to choose one of the notebooks here. <clears throat> I'm also going to expand the screen size um, so we can right. Um, Let's go um, with, um, all right, so we're gonna make the screen a, a little bit bigger. Um, so you can see the list of um, models, uh, notebooks I've, I've created. Um, I typically put all my um, uh, notebooks with different demos uh, is a way um, you need to look at. Um, today, we're gonna do the uh, November um, tabular uh, competition. Um, so we're going to take the um, Kaggle competition for November uh, data set. Um, you can tell here that I've already uh, run it. It's got a score of 0.724. Um, that's not a great score. I think I got like a rank of 650. Um, but uh, the point was I could do that in five minutes. Uh, so for five minutes uh, of work, that's not a bad rank. Uh, I'm sure if I spend days and months on it, I can get a better rank. Uh, but something to keep in mind when you work with a tool like um, Deep Out of ML is how powerful it is that with five minutes of work, um, you're able to build a baseline model. And so that's what we're going to do right now. So we're going to do an edit. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I am in the right one. Um, so um, you can see here that this notebook is based on uh, two other notebooks. So I want to thank them. Um, the data here. Um, I'm going to use the, uh, somebody has created some extra features. So I'm, I, I am in this notebook using their uh, features. So uh, this one has got one, the train has got uh, 1.2 gigabytes and, uh, um, and the test has got uh, 1.09 gigabytes. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's the beauty of, um, you know, what um, we are doing here is uh, we are able to demonstrate with real big, data, um, which, you know, is, is very rare in the AutoML world, where demos are done with MNIST um, or demos are done with IRIS uh, data or demos are done with uh, Boston. Uh, those all have 100 rows. Here we are actually going to run it with one gigabytes of data, right? So all you do is pip install deep AutoML. <clears throat> It's going to take a few um, seconds. <clears throat> and, and in the meantime, while it um, does that install, I'm going to uh, go ahead and answer the question. So um, how does it handle time series data, right? Um, it doesn't handle time series data yet. Um, that's one uh, reason. There, I have another uh, library called Auto Time Series. Um, it actually uses XGBoost, Facebook Profit, and a few others. Um, I need to run, I need to write a small amount of code to make a deep out of ML run time series. I just haven't found the time, but thanks for reminding me, I'll, I'll do that. The second is how do you feed the training data with multiple records? Um, we're gonna show you examples in a text and image. We're gonna upload an entire folder. Um, so you can actually uh, upload folders, but when it comes to tabular data, um, you can have any sized, file you want, like we are currently having one gigabyte, it'll feed it automatically by record 
uh, you know, batches of 32, 64, and so on. So don't worry about that. It'll automatically select the batch size and stuff. All right, so it's successfully installed Deep Auto ML. All we have to do now is to say from Deep Auto ML, import uh, as Deep Auto. Um, ignore uh, the warnings. I'm using a GPU, by the way. So you can see in the settings, I'm using a GPU. So that's uh, perfectly fine. It automatically detects the GPU and it'll, it'll set the settings uh, called strategy scope and stuff. So we are going to, uh, I mentioned to you that one of my favorite models um, is the uh, fast one model. I forgot to tell you that there is a, a little problem with the data. Um, the train and test data have uh, one extra feature in train um, that's not in test. So uh, even though we don't use pandas or we don't need to use pandas, I have to unfortunately drop this extra variable. So I am using um, pandas to show you. <clears throat> so the name of the file, um, we are not using pandas. So let me emphasize that uh, we are using pandas only in this case because uh, the train and test have different set of features. And I wanna get rid of this uh, extra uh, variable called kfold. Um, but that's the only reason I'm loading it into pandas. But typically, uh, if you have um, a trained data set uh, and the test data set will have the same number of features, then you don't have to use uh, this train. You can use the file name uh, here as, as train underscore file name, and it will run uh, perfectly. Uh, but in this particular case, since I have to drop a, a, a field, I'm doing that. Uh, you can see there are hundreds of variables. It's got like 100 variables. I've dropped the K4 variable. And so um, you've got, I think, 600,000 rows, 102 variable, 102. And that's not a problem for us because we are using, um, right? We are using uh, deep bottom ML. And uh, we are going to use the model type as fast one. So we are going to run. The project name is the folder in which you're going to save the model. Uh, so we're going to just kick off the uh, model. Uh, we're going to come back and take a look at it periodically so you can see um, at what stage it's in. Uh, this should take about 20, 26 minutes. Um, I've previously run it. Uh, sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower, but um, let's, uh, let's uh, leave that and uh, come back, all right? and take some questions uh, in the meantime. If not, we'll go back to the presentation. All right, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to um, show you just how Kaggle um, competitions have uh, used uh, Keras in the past. Um, so your typical uh, data set in, uh, or your um, right demo uh, is going to be like this. Import TensorFlow, you know, from TensorFlow import Keras, and from Keras load MNIST dataset, uh, split it into train and test, X train, Y train. Here's my deep neural network, four lines, okay, five. Uh, sequential, flatten this and just come up with a bunch of dense layers. I don't know why I chose 128, but hey, I'm gonna try 128. Um, and then I know I need 10, um, right, uh, classes in MNIST. And I'm going to opt to right, use Adam. I don't know why I'm using Adam, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, so, and 99.9% .9 of auto ML tools will use the metric accuracy because, hey, <laughs> if it's uh, if it's imbalanced data set, I'm going to look good because 99% of my right, 99% uh, of my data is the zero class. Only 1% is the one class, and I'll be able to show everyone I got 99% accuracy, right? So. This is kind of how 90% of like AutoML tools are demonstrated. Um, and we are gonna show uh, that that is not the case with deep AutoML. Um, this does not, by the way, this code will not work in the real world at all, right? Why? Because you cannot first um, import it into uh, NumPy or Pandas, they'll blow up. Second, um, if you built a model with just this particular four layers or five layers and you don't know why you chose them, you might get very good results or very bad results. And if you showed a metric as accuracy or Adam and so on, you will not be able to explain why you chose any of them and you've not done any hyperparameter tuning. And for you to do the tuning will take days if not months. So um, let's take an example of how Deep Auto ML builds a model. So this is a typical model that Deep Auto ML builds. Uh, this is um, 
a deep and wide uh, model. As you can tell, um, the same variables go through two layers, uh, two sets of networks. Uh, so the same variable here are, are getting uh, pre-processed and from there they uh, concatenated. Um, and from concatenation, um, they uh, go through a wide, uh, right? The concatenation straight away goes into uh, a wide, uh, meaning they, the variables go directly um, into um, uh, the dense, final dense layer, the output layer. Um, and then these same variables are concatenated and they go through a deep layer. And the deep layer has multiple uh, dense uh, layers or hidden layers. And then you will, you will concatenate both and feed them to get your result. Um, this is just one example of how uh, difficult it is to build a deep and wide layer for just one example data set. To do that for any data set requires an orders of magnitude level of uh, thinking and hard work um, in order to do that for any data set. And that's exactly what deep ML does. On top of that, um, we're also providing you some additional features that you won't find anywhere else. Um, one, uh, automatic feature transformation. So um, basically for most uh, AutoML tools, you'll have to feed only numeric features. If you feed them, um, you know, different kinds of string, text, image, um, they all blow up. Um, but here we actually uh, classify features, find out what they are like, and we actually transform them uh, to the right, uh, right uh, uh, numeric uh, embeddings and so on. We also fill out missing values. So if you have missing values, I had a, um, a you know, a Kaggle uh, competitor uh, come to me and say he had a data set and I ran the data set and found that, it, you know, deep bottom ML was erroring and I wanted to know why. So I went to the data set and found that there were a lot of infinite, uh, infinite values. So I had to go and uh, fix deep out of the mouth so that it was able to handle infinites by um, basically setting uh, 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 upper bound uh, and so on. So a missing value handling uh, is there, automatic feature crosses. So if you wanted to do feature crossing, um, there's a Keras pre-processing layer for feature crosses, out of the mouth uh, or deep out of the mouth gives you the chance to uh, do those feature crosses. Also in TensorFlow, you will get an error if your uh, variable name uh, is somewhat uh, odd. Uh, and you will not be able to tell why you got that error unless you study TensorFlow um, deeply. And I found out the hard way that if there is a space or, in, or a blank space in your uh, variable name, uh, TensorFlow is going to give blow up and give an error, but the error is not going to say your variable name has a blank space. It'll say something else. So um, you actually have to find that out. Um, and so I, you know, changed the variable name with an underscore. So your, you know, your data set is saved and it doesn't blow up for that reason. Uh, we automatically do label encoding for target target labels. So if your target label is survived true or false. Uh, that's a, you know, could be a text string or it could be a Boolean variable and uh, automatically label encoding the, uh, right, the target variable um, is not done by uh, most tools, but it comes uh, with uh, deep out of the mail. Uh, also deep out of mail out of the box can handle multi-label, multi-class um, and so on. I can go on and on, but the, you know, hopefully you get the picture. So once you train the model, it can be used directly for predictions on raw data. So I've taken an example of the uh, Google Cloud platform uh, where you can set uh, basically a model name. So I've given it a model name, property price, version name, and you can uh, basically uh, send this as uh, your, right? Uh, these are all, by the way, on the cloud console. That's why you don't have a string. So don't think of it as <laughs> Python code. This is not Python code. <laughs> this is uh, the cloud shell. Uh, so if you are wondering why there is no string, uh, like a uh, double quote or a single quote. Uh, the reason is this is you are you are supposed to type this into the cloud shell. All right. So if you go to the Google Cloud platform and type into the cloud shell a model name and a version name and give it a name that you that you want, you can take the model that you built and you can uh, basically put that on the vertex AI platform, uh, save the model, and then from there um, you can deploy the model onto the vertex AI for predictions. And that's all you'll have to do. 
um, that this uh, code can do that. And if you uh, were to want to make predictions, look at the predictions uh, input JSON. Square footage is a number, but the type of the house is a string called house. This is something you cannot do with RML tools uh, unless you have the Keras preprocessing layers built in, which case it returned the type of the house into a, a label encoded uh, variable, numeric variable, and it will only deep RML kind of models can do that. That is a model that's got Keras preprocessing layers built in. So I hope that gives you an idea of how to right, use uh, deep RML. We're going to take a, a little pause. And now we are going to uh, go back and check uh, the running right of the uh, TPS. So um, continues to run. Uh, you can see here um, the model is still running. Uh, like I said, um, we've um, probably spent uh, about ten minutes um, running this, <clears throat> and. I'll just walk you through the process that it's going through. How does deep out of ML work under the hood? You are seeing that it finds that there are 101 uh, numeric columns um, and there's uh, right, uh, no other type of columns in this. And it prints those out. Uh, there are no other types of columns. It, it does some analysis to figure out whether you should do uh, feature crossing. In this particular case, you cannot do any feature crossing because they're all uh, numeric. Um, and then it checks and sees if there are any NLP variables. There's none. And uh, we are uh, basically uh, finding that there's a, a nicely balanced data set with 50-50 uh, as being our, uh, uh, right, our, our distribution. Um, now, in this particular case, we are going to uh, build a model, like I said, a deep and wide uh, layer uh, model. <clears throat> and it is currently running. Um, so one of the things that um, I uh, wanted to change how uh, AutoML tools are measured is uh, I decided from the get-go that I would not use accuracy as a metric for classification as a default. We'd use balanced um, accuracy or what is known as balanced sparse categorical accuracy in, in TensorFlow. But balanced basically says that if you were to predict all ones or all zeros, and you get 99% accuracy in an imbalanced uh, model, that balanced accuracy would be 50% 50, 50 because you got, you got all ones right or all zeros right, but you do not get any of this, uh, you know ones or zeros right. So uh, balanced accuracy in that case would be 50%. If you were to use that to measure a lot of AutoML tools, you'll find that they're all falling short by a big amount because they all use accuracy as the main measure and that's very misleading. So from day one, I built uh, a deep order of ML to show you deep uh, balance accuracy. So you can see that if it says it's 70%, hey, it's got balanced on the balance, both uh, the zero class and the one class, right? And, and it's accurate uh, on both the classes. <clears throat> so that's what it's doing right now. We will um, come back. No, 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 no. I know I've gone through a lot. <laughs> and, uh, um, probably a little fast. I hope um, you're able to follow along. Okay, all right. So I do have a quick question. Sure. If you don't mind, Ram. Um, you know, it ties in together so many different tools uh, and pieces. And like you mentioned, you had lots of intricate questions about how everything works because you need to tie it in. How worried are you about, um, you know, changes to the underlying software that's being used, being made that will sort of break the system you've built and who is yeah, made? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so um, Optina uh, is something that I, uh, you know, don't have uh, too much uh, knowledge of. I'm only using it as a tuner or, a, or an optimizer. Um, the rest of them, um, I'm pretty close to, um, right, at least what's going on uh, in, in the TensorFlow world because I can at least read up about it um, and find out in Keras. Um, the other one that uh, is a storm um, Storm is um, something that's very simple under the hood. Um, so the changes that are being made are there are not very dramatic. Um, and so uh, I have not, I'm more worried about um, the changes to the TensorFlow uh, syntax where, you know, libraries can move around a lot. 
than I am uh, with um, you know other things. So what I've done is to freeze uh, each um, right requirements.txt setup.py uh, files uh, to the exact version number. So when you uh, install something, uh, it installs the exact version number of TensorFlow that that particular version will run on. And you, like you're going to see in the Kaggle notebook that I'm running, it's it's uh, right. It's installed uh, the right uh, libraries and the right versions, right? Uh, here, you you saw that it, it installed uh, it uninstalled a few things and installed the right version. So uh, six NumPy. I actually don't use the latest version of NumPy because I don't know if you know um, TensorFlow has a problem. Um, so I use an older version. Uh, TensorFlow. Uh, you know, I use 2.6 um, and so on. So TensorFlow is currently at 2.7. So the, these are a few things that I uh, have, uh, you know, kind of fixed so that, you know, your your code doesn't break. That helpful? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any, any other uh, question? I, I want this to be helpful for you. So, you know, no question is too, I would say, uh, right, is uh, too simple or too simplistic, you know? Uh, so if you feel like your question might appear to be simple, uh, it may not be. So I wouldn't feel shy about asking questions. There's one more question in the, in the chat, Ram. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah, so great uh, question on MLflow. Um, Auto uh, Vimal can be integrated with MLflow um, because MLflow is an API and um, it can be done. I have not uh, done that yet, partly because um, it would, you know, it, it will take me some time, and um, I have not really uh, focused much on um, MLflow and, and the API, but. It, it can be uh, very quickly uh, done. I'm more focused at the moment on time series and a couple of other things um, that that uh, are higher priority. But if if people uh, you know talk about collaborating, incorporating MLflow, um, I'd be happy to collaborate with someone who knows a bit about MLflow, and we can easily uh, combine that. How do you track performance? Um, you know, tracking performance uh, comes with something like MLflow, the other thing um, you can do um, is every time you run, it creates a, a, a new model and it saves it under the, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say here, uh, right? You, you got logs, right? Um, the my logs um, shows you the TensorBoard logs are saved there in under deep out of ML. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that's uh, being saved. Each time a model is uh, run or trained, it saves it under the time uh, date and timestamp. So you actually get a new model every time. And, and the TensorBoard is uh, an amazing tool that um, each model uh, has its own TensorBoard logs so that you can compare multiple models using TensorBoard. So that's why I've not been very focused on MLflow because I know that with TensorBoard, uh, it's very easy to compare multiple models. All right, uh, another question. Is it possible to attribute model performance differences to individual architectural components? Not yet. Not, uh, I mean, uh, that's very uh, difficult uh, to attribute, you know, hey, we got a 5% improvement in the model. That's because we changed the activation. But um, if you were to um, uh, write, uh, model changes. And every time you run the model with a different architecture or different activation function, let's say, and you get a different uh, saved uh, file or uh, model, um, obviously with TensorBoard, you'll be able to see, ha, huh, I changed this and I got a, this performance. I changed this and I got a different performance. As long as you keep the name of the project um, right different, you'll, you'll, you can get infinite number of individual changes to your performance and track them that way and just compare them using TensorFlow. <clears throat> right? Um, so while, while this runs, uh, which is uh, good for us, 
Um, we look at other types of models like NLP and text. I've got another um, demo, which is for um, deep out of ML and it's for NLP. And I'm taking basically a, a, a social media um, data, uh, uh, right, um, data set that's from Kaggle. It's called social media. And it's uh, basically uh, distinguishes between disasters. Uh, so if it's a disaster or let's say earthquake, fire, um, car crash, it, it would say it's relevant. Relevant means it's a disaster. Um, these are called disaster tweets. And there are some that are just regular tweets and being able to distinguish between them. So we've got 10,000 rows, just two columns. One is a text and the other one. All we have to do is to uh, choose the name of the target. So we, we've got the name of the target is choose one. Um, I have dropped 16 rows um, because there's a third uh, call. Or there's a third class called can't decide. It's 16. I don't think it matters. Uh, so we're dropping them. And now we are going to just feed uh, into deep out of ML, uh, basically the same syntax. When, as soon as you import deep out of ML, it gives you the syntax because you know you, you can very easily copy paste it. And that's what we are doing here. So I'm going to use the NLP column name uh, as text. You don't have to do that. Um, uh, and you know I'm just trying to show you that you can fill in the missing wherever there's uh, you know no uh, nans you can fill it with missing but you don't have to do that and um, if you were to uh, feed the train data uh, right uh, set which is because we dropped the 16 rows we are we are sending the train uh, data frame um, it starts running and I'm not running it because uh, this is another um, right one that that will take you know 15 20 minutes to finish. Um, I want you to see the results right away. So um, I've already run it, and you can you can see it in my um, link that I posted. Um, so you 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 see here it's got 57% of tweets that are not relevant, and one 43% um, that are relevant. Uh, it starts processing with um, the NLP layer, which it detects automatically. You don't have to tell it what what is the name of the text uh, column. It detects that automatically. It creates a functional, uh, Keras functional model. Here's a very simple model. It uses a, a encoder uh, called Suvo. I don't know how many of you uh, have heard of Suvo, but it basically is a, a TensorFlow hub model and it loads that automatically. So um, if you were to use TensorFlow hub and use the uh, name Suvo uh, or, or search for the name, um, you're going to uh, find this model. So let's go and share the screen. So you can see that there is a, a model called Swivel, and it's a token-based text embedding model trained on Google News of 130 gigabytes. Um, this is uh, one of the best models for, you know, lightweight, uh, one of the best lightweight models that's ever uh, being created um, for, uh, a lot of use, you'll find that this model outperforms um, even bigger models like BERT. Um, so um, I love this model. So I've incorporated that into uh, any uh, NLP uh, text, but you can choose your own model and give um, your own model name. So you can copy this link and you can, uh, you can uh, give it in the NLP text. And there is indeed, uh, if you go to the documentation and read it, um, you can uh, give one of the options here uh, for the uh, Keras uh, model options. Uh, you know, you, you can give it the, the link and it will go and download that model from that link and it will actually use that model instead of Suvo. So I've given all of those um, instructions in the uh, deep out of ML uh, Git. So I'm going to now um, take you to that Git. <clears throat> So um, here's the um, here's the Git um, for deep out of ML. Um, I've given you a lot of uh, detailed documentation. Here's a video I did that if you want to uh, understand how uh, you know go back before this video I created this. Um, this is about an hour and a half as well. 
Um, and you can actually uh, change the name of the model that you want uh, here. So if you were to say model options, I want um, my own model, right? Uh, here's the exact one. Ten model options. If you say the TensorFlow Hub model and give it the URL, um, you can give any URL you want. You can give BERT. Um, you can give any model you like. You don't have to choose Sumo. And I will go to that URL and download that model and use it for deep order now. So that's a nice feature if you're interested. Um, so let's go back. All right. So um, currently, um, the model has uh, finished uh, training. Uh, it took 23 minutes, as you can see here. Um, so it says here, time taken to train the model, 23 minutes. The following metrics uh, are available. Um, and it tells you uh, what the right architecture of the model is, uh, which you know, we, we will see in a, a, in a second. It'll, it'll put a picture. <clears throat> It saves the uh, right the artifacts um, that I mentioned earlier, how the variables are actually transformed. Those things are saved because it's needed for uh, prediction. Um, the The reason is there are uh, small things that are not able to transfer from just using Keras itself. That that I need to save it in a dictionary in order for it to be used for prediction. All right, so um, that's going. It's also using a, a simple uh, validation data set, which it has set aside. And you're gonna see the results of how it performed on that validation data set. I think it's about uh, five or 10% of your data. So your training data, it takes uh, most of it. And then uh, it takes sets aside a small uh, data set. So you can see that it has trained uh, well. It needed only about 12 epochs. Um, you could have uh, spent uh, more time, but since I chose fast one, which is a deep and wide model with very few epochs. Uh, you can see that it's doing pretty well, 70%. Um, the RCAC is 74%. The F1 score is 72%. The balanced accuracy is 72%, and so on. So this is all important stuff, um, which uh, to me uh, shows how truly an order ML tool should uh, display its results, which is show me everything, show me average precision, recall, F1 score, everything. So I can decide whether the model is good or not. Most folks just show you accuracy, and that I think is very misleading. All right. Um, any other uh, questions, or, or shall we go to the All right? So um, these are some of the uh, features of uh, Deep Part of ML. Um, there's more, uh, more uh, that are coming. I mentioned to you that automated distributed training. Currently, there is a, a bug that's preventing me from using uh, TPUs. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out uh, where that bug in TensorFlow is in my code. Um, so once we do that, we should be able to run this on TPUs. Um, One-step model hosting on various cloud platform. My goal is to uh, basically help you uh, choose a model, a cloud uh, um, player and say, hey, host, you know, put this model or save this model on a bucket on GCP, save this model on AWS, save this model on Azure by just you know one line. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet. The other thing that people have asked me is to build some time series like RNN sequence to sequence. Um, same thing uh, people have asked me is cloud hosted. Uh, if I can put a, a, my image text files in, uh, in GCS buckets, can you just read it from them? You, I can't really read them unless you give me authorization. So I'm figuring out what's the best way to ask people to, you know, for that um, information when they, when they like uh, use their own library, um, uh, deep out of ML on their own machine. Uh, another thing I wanna add is line or SHAP uh, to this so that we can get some explainability for our predictions. And finally, I wanna uh, create what I consider to be the uh, ultimate uh, model, which is you can give image, text and structured data and run it. I've already gotten it working with structured and text, structured and image. I, I just have to put them all together, probably one more step, and then that should be the ultimate uh, model, an uh, audio tool. You can have an image in one folder, text in another folder, uh, and structured data as a CSV file. It'll combine all of them and, and build a single model for you. 
I'm almost there, but I probably just need a few more days of like quiet time to be able to do that. Right, so questions. Um, if I want to adjust uh, parameters, example, learning rate or not, now the hardware modified is it fully integrated? Um, so great question, uh, Jua uh, Wang, uh, Wang. Is there an example? All right, so um, yeah. So what we are seeing here is, uh, uh, right, uh, there are several examples of how to change your, um, uh, this thing, so we're gonna see that. Uh, if you go to the GitHub, um, I, I give you an example of uh, changing uh, the Keras options. So if you go to the GitHub and you look for the word Keras options, you can change the Keras options and say, hey, I don't want patients to be, you know, normally it's 10, I want patients to be 30. Let's say you wanna change the activation uh, to always use a certain thing you can have that. Um, let's say you have, um, there are so many Keras options, uh, basically like early stopping, um, right? Uh, different callbacks and so on, that all of those, I can't list all of them here, but if there is any Keras option um, that, that is not covered here, you can basically cover it here. Same way with the model options. There is a lot of model options that you have to read the documentation. Uh, you also can provide a model option called uh, do feature uh, feature crossing, and if you set it to true, um, it'll do feature crossing for only the categorical variables. And uh, let's say uh, you want to do tuning, but you want to limit the number of trials. I think the default is always uh, default is like twenty. Let's say you want max trials to be five. You can just say model options max trials equal to five. You can combine all of them by just putting a comma in the dictionary, so you can have a single dictionary that says model options and put. All, all the options you want in that. And let's say you uh, you don't like the model um, that, that deep out of ML builds, but you like the pipeline. So if you give the model option, model use case as pipeline, then you will get only the Keras pre-processing layers. So you can attach it to any model you want and you can build your own custom model. Let's say you wanna have a, a transfer learning where you've got a pre-trained uh, model and you can feed that model by giving uh, uh, my model, use my model, my sequential model. This is your sequential model architecture. Now, you might say, hey, I really want to use um, everything from the input layer up to the final layer. I just want to swap out the final layer and use my pre-trained model. Well, um, yeah, and then retrain it with just my uh, data. I don't think you need deep out of the mouth for something like that for transfer learning because most of the work that Deep Water Vimal does is in building the, the dense layers and how many, how, what's the activation. You know, that's the reason why you come to Deep Water Vimal. You're not coming here where you've got your entire, you know, model built out, pre-trained, and you just want to, you know, uh, retrain it again on your data. You don't need, you just need a couple of lines of code. You don't need Deep Water Vimal for that. I hope I've answered that question. Maybe it's not the answer you wanted, but I feel like that's not the goal of deep out of the mouth. I hope that that's, uh, you know, I uh, in in working on auto ML, um, what I found is that like in auto is, um, I don't try to do everything. Um, and I try to do only what I believe uh, is like a missing piece of the puzzle and a lot of people say uh, about auto uh, well, it only does visualization. Well, <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> only, it's only supposed to do visualization. So uh, you go to pandas profiling, you go to something else and so on, right? So uh, Yash um, is asking a question. Can you tell me what is the most uh, usable use case for this library? So the most usable use case, I would say are all three, um, structured data, NLP and, and image. Um, if you are building models for those use cases, you should definitely try out um, Deep Auto ML. And secondly, um, if you have gigabytes of data and you're struggling to build your own TensorFlow model, you should come here, right? And that is the main use case for this. 
because all of the problems with TensorFlow uh, TF data data sets that you will encounter uh, have probably already been solved by this uh, library. And if you're just going to be uh, struggling with it on your own without much help from Stack Overflow and stuff, because it's all so new, then I would suggest you come to Deep Out of ML and download it. And the second, uh, what is the scenario for D the data science teams? Data science teams, um, at least when I used to work in a team, we used to um, you know, ask uh, our colleagues to build a, a baseline model or a challenger model so that what we build uh, is beaten or is not beaten by the other person. So we always had that uh, competitive spirit um, where each one of us would try to uh, ask the other person um, to try to beat our model. And that way we all learned. And if you don't have that uh, ability, uh, you can use Deep Out of ML to build a model and try to beat what it does. I'm pretty sure you can beat it, but at least it gives you a baseline of what you need to do in order to um, right, do. Any other question? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I still have to uh, demo the uh, NLP and an image. Um, so I'm going to go to that. I, I hope um, all of you can um, like check out the uh, GitHub. Uh, I've given actually um, example notebooks, um, right? Um, in the GitHub. <clears throat> so here we are. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> So um, you can uh, go to the GitHub and you can um, read it, or uh, you can go straight to uh, examples and you can uh, download the examples I've got here. So you know that those are the two uh, easiest things for you to get started uh, on on deep out of the mouth. and. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, does it, uh, can it handle data augmentation pipeline, custom data augmentation, not the ATF image or something like that? Um, no, that, that's a very good question. Data augmentation, which I've used in uh, NLP is a separate um, step that you have to do um, in trying to integrate that into model building. I don't think it's fair. Um, what this does, itself is a tremendous amount of work um, that adding uh, other things that uh, that you know are are extraneous to it I think will overly uh, complicate this uh, process and it, it's also not built by a team of 20 or 30 people it's built by one person so um, typically I like to keep it focused on something that I can master and something that I can do and the rest um, can be basically done but whatever little that it does, I try to make sure that it is um, kind of, you know, somewhat state of the art, that it's not uh, easily doable uh, by just a person sitting around uh, playing with, you know, a few hours of code. Uh, that would that would be quite difficult to do with all of my altered mode <laughs> libraries. Um, yeah, I'm very open to contributors. <laughs> so I would be very happy to take on contributors. Um, so if you are interested, let me know. I'd be very happy to take on some help. The, uh, the idea is not to uh, build it on my own for fame or money. The idea is to make a contribution um, to, to help others. So if you have that same mindset and you don't care about um, whether it's famous or not so famous, then I think uh, this is something that you, know, you can do. And it's very easy, in my opinion, to extend what deep out of ML does. Um, I've uh, got you know folks come in and um, basically take the code and reuse it in their um, Streamlit app or other kinds of applications that they built on top of this. Um, and you can uh, basically see that, um, that the project that I have has uh, basically got multiple um, repositories and each one of those repositories uh, by themselves has a, um, a you know a decent number of followers that 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 you can uh, basically uh, write uh, take you know 
you know, for example, out of his uh, right uh, over here uh, is got uh, close to, I would say, uh, where this is, uh, one second, Let me stop the sharing <clears throat> um, and take it, all right, I take it back here. And um, basically when you, um, In Autovis itself, you can see that there are um, right, quite a number of uh, folks that, that use Autovis um, as their fundamental uh, building block. There's, it's used by over 101 uh, different uh, libraries and books as, as kind of the underlying base for their own tools. So uh, my uh, usually my hope is that People take these auto tools and they use them to right, build apps around it. And that's the idea. All right, so I'm going to uh, now uh, jump into NLP and, and, and uh, just you know, show uh, the COVID-19 image classification. Um, so uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, problem. Uh, COVID-19 uh, x-rays uh, are available on Kaggle. And basically, uh, this is not uh, a single um, file, it's actually a folder. I mentioned to you earlier that um, folders are where images are stored. And all you have to do is to give it the name of the folder. And you can see here on the data side, uh, the COVID folder has train, uh, has got COVID normal viral pneumonia, and it's got train COVID normal viral pneumonia. So it's basically a folder under a folder. And this is something that um, other AutoML tools cannot do. Um, this one basically takes the folder itself. Uh, all you have to tell it is give it the name of the folder. You got to give it the name of the uh, image height, the number of channels, and there you go. Uh, the same syntax, same everything. You just have to give it the name of the uh, model type as image. And we've done that. Um, it starts running um, and it uses a model that's called um, mobile net. And uh, that model basically gives you like a 93%. Uh, like I said, in, I typically don't like accuracy, but in this particular case, I decided to give accuracy as one of the metrics uh, simply because it was not an imbalanced data set. Um, and we are going to actually see that it's better, uh, the model does better. Uh, so here's how the sample uh, data set looks uh, normal uh, x rays, viral pneumonia x rays, and COVID. Uh, x-rays and the, you know, test and validation accuracy, train accuracy is in the 90 range. I'm not very impressed because I want to see that in action. Uh, so we actually are going to give it a test folder and the test folder, uh, basically we are going to ask it to predict. And uh, on the test folder, uh, we find, I think it gets somewhere in the 99% range or something right. Um, so, you know, all, all good. Um, you know, I always like to um, see better performance from the models. But uh, if you're not getting a performance uh, from a certain model, uh, do let me know. And I, I'd always like to investigate why. But this is another uh, notebook that you can uh, look at. And um, we are going to go uh, finally um, back to the, right, um, the, uh, the one that was running, uh, which was the November. Um, so we, we ran this for about um, 23 minutes. Like I said, on the uh, evaluation um, matrix, you've got 73% F1 score. Um, We're gonna now, um, sorry. Um, so we're gonna um, test it on a test data set. <clears throat> It, the test data set is also, by the way, very large. <clears throat> okay. It's not um, loaded yet. So it's got um, 540,000 rows, 101 variable uh, features. Um, now we are gonna make predictions on that. <clears throat> 
So it's loaded the data. It's still uh, running. <clears throat> So a uh, question on uh, good for video classification. Uh, I haven't uh, tried it on video um, classification yet. Um, I know there's a pending uh, item um, also on audio, um, but I'd be happy um, if someone were to give me a data set or a cattle notebook uh, with an example, they tried deep out of ML and they didn't work. I'd be happy to find out why um, that might be more helpful. Uh, but definitely, uh, if you've got something in Kaggle um, that you'd like to try it on and it didn't work, let me know. I typically get a few, uh, I would say, issues every week um, that I work on. And if you've got an issue, please file it on the GitHub and I'd be more than happy to take a look. All right, so here we are. Um, we are looking at the um, number of steps needed to predict. It's going to take 8,000 because the batch size. I typically limit the batch size. Um, I think it was um, Francois Cholet who uh, invented uh, Keras who said that we should not be using more than in like batch size of 64. Um, so I try to limit the batch size to be a small number. Sometimes it goes up, uh, but most of the times I try to limit it. All right, um, we are now, uh, almost towards the end of the submission. I'm gonna press the submit button. Um, you can see that um, <clears throat> this notebook basically uh, has been already run and we've already gotten a score of 0. 0.724. I don't expect that to change, but anyway, we are going to go ahead and submit it because we ran it and we're gonna see what uh, rank we are gonna get. Um, <clears throat> probably not a you know, very high one, but we didn't, we didn't uh, tune this uh, like I said, uh, FAST is just meant to give you a FAST score. It's not meant to give you the most performant model. Auto is the option you need to try to get a very performant model. And that may take a, an hour or more to run because it tries various deep layers, the number of dense layers, the number of uh, activation, the different uh, kinds of uh, right uh, hyperparameters that you can tune. So all of those take time. And the max trials is the, is the variable that controls it. So if you uh, try to change the max trials to 10, 15, 20, you, you can get a, you know, more and more, uh, I would say more and more performant model as you increase the number of max trials to 30 and so on. All right, um, so any other question? So uh, hey, Rem, there's, I, one, in, yeah, there's, there's one, one in the, in the uh, chat, chat, I believe. I believe. Uh, yeah, the, the demo question I answered about the video classification already. Okay, perfect, perfect. thanks. All right. Cool. Um, so uh, predictions we are seeing here, we're going to um, now uh, submit this and we're going to just look at the sample submission. Um, so just to make sure it's not predicting all ones, I want to just show you that it's predicting about 52% ones. So um, it's about similar to the number of ones that are the trained data set. So uh, we know that this is not uh, fake. Um, so we, we submit this. So here we are. Uh, we're going to submit this, and we're going to see um, what the results are in a second. What rank we're going to get, and as you, as you, as I mentioned earlier, um, that data set was quite large for a demo, uh, one gigabytes, uh, 102 uh, features, over 600,000 rows. Um, typically, you don't get to see um, this kind of a demo uh, with an AutoML tool even uh, <laughs> professional <laughs> things that cost millions of dollars. Uh, because, you know, it, it does not complete on time for a demo. <laughs> That's the biggest problem, <laughs> right? So um, um, I think it's, it's going to take a few minutes. I know we are out of time, but um, any other questions before we close? So uh, uh, this is a, a great question to set max time for training. Um, I have not um, done that um, because I kind of feel like you should focus more on the architectures I have, not on the time to train. Um, fast is meant to give you a very fast model. 
So fast, fast one, fast two are all like different gradations of models in terms of time. Auto is being the one that's the most complicated. Um, and um, I, I, I don't believe in setting max time. Um, so that's the reason there is no max time for trading because you can be very wrong in estimating what the max time for a model or a data set ought to be. We might think for this ma, you know, data set for gigabytes, it should take a few hours and set the max time while well, it got done in 23 minutes. Um, and it's a very uh, good performing model. Or you might set uh, for some other uh, data set, five minutes is the max time. It should have taken five hours instead. I always feel like you should focus on architectures and trying out different architectures than trying to artificially set uh, the max time that you're willing to give it for training. So I don't think I will do that. Yeah, Shreyas, uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, Aram. I was wondering, is there a, a shutoff based on the learning rate itself? Like if the learning rate is not improving anymore, then does the model, like, you know, can we- Yeah, shut the model down early stopping is the way you do that. So okay. you said early stopping anyway, when the model, when it doesn't improve, um, it, it stops. So we saw that here um, that the model training um, stopped after uh, 12 epochs because of early stopping because it didn't improve. And right, it's, it's based on the val balanced sparse um, categorical accuracy. Uh, and that is, I think, the best metric uh, to stop, to decide to stop on, um, on the validation data set, which it has never seen. Um, so that's, that's the best way. So how do you take the model and serve it locally? Um, that's a great question. It's uh, very simple. You can just, um, right, uh, this model uh, right here, uh, right? So we are going to go here, um, press refresh, um, and we're gonna see the project name TPS November 21. That is the name of the project that I gave this particular, uh, this, this particular uh, session. Um, and here's the fast one model. I told you that we, we save models based on date timestamp. So here's the timestamp for that. It's around at uh, five o'clock. Um, and you can see that the model is now saved under that saved model. All you have to do is to um, take that saved model uh, .pb file and the Keras metadata pb file. And um, uh, there are any number of commands um, that you can Google uh, how to serve that TensorFlow model locally would take you two minutes to find that. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I gave you instructions on how to serve it on Google Cloud, but I'm sure um, you can find out how to serve it locally uh, using uh, TorchServe, using TensorFlow itself, TensorFlow serving, TF serving. Um, what else? Uh, questions? Um, so uh, while this is running, I believe that it is completed, um, right? And um, we can actually uh, see, uh, we can actually go here. We can actually go here, right? Uh, so let's go to the um, notebook. Um, we can uh, look at our work. <clears throat> um, so here's the competition. So I'm, I'm gonna share um, what the competition looks like. Um, here's the TPS competition, um, right? So this notebook when it ran, I think, um, right? This uh, thing hasn't changed much, 724, the best score, um, logs. So you get the logs here. Okay, uh, let's go to the competition. Here's the here's the competition. Okay, let's go to the competition here. Um, you can see the lead of my submissions, and you can see that uh, you know uh, it's completed. Point uh, seven two four. It is not updated yet. Um, it is not. Uh, it is not a you know completely finished running yet. So,
All right. Um, any uh, the any further questions? All right, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, demo this uh, library. I hope you find it useful. Um, I, you know, um, I hope that you can take it further uh, from here and either use it for experimentation or to like build on top of it on your own. Uh, it's really, really um, meant to be shared and used by everyone. Thank you so much, Ram. I really appreciate it. And look, if uh, if you find even a couple of people that are willing to help and contribute, that would be a great success. And for those joining, if uh, you end up playing around with this and, and find it helpful, that's that's the goal. So I hope you all you've all enjoyed. Um, and I hope this is just the uh, the first of many great talks that you would have uh, enjoyed throughout these past couple of days. And again for tomorrow and the following day. So. Thanks again, Ram. I really appreciate it. Thank you, those uh, and everybody for joining. And I look forward to uh, to seeing everybody on the platform tomorrow and hop in and uh, to you. And uh, again, have a good evening, everyone. And thank you, Ram, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you soon. This is hopefully isn't the last time that we have you on. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Uh, we <laughs> appreciate this opportunity. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Enjoy your night. night.